just couldn't be helped. You know those departmental meetings always run over time. I was a little late getting in from work myself. Just as I got in, the elders called. Said they'd be here around 7.30. Bud, is there any special reason why they're coming? Well, Arthur said that he and Miguel Hernandez wanted to discuss something about Lee. Oh, Bud, what has Lee done? Oh, nothing really wrong. I think they said his field service hours have dropped off the last couple of months. But could that be so? He's still regular on Saturday mornings. And doesn't he still go out some after school? Not lately. He's been staying after school playing ball. Is that where he is now? I guess so. He should be here soon, though. Well, I guess it's all right. He needs to have some time with the boys. And the exercise will do him good. As long as he's regular in Saturday morning magazine work and gets out from time to time on Sundays. Bud, I think we can be proud of Lee. He's pretty level-headed for his age. And the kids in this neighborhood are so much better than that wild bunch where we used to live. Only, I do wish you and Lee could spend more time together. Since we've moved here, it seems like you're hardly ever home. Oh, Bud, I'll heat up your dinner before the brothers come. Hope you don't mind leftovers. That's fine. Anne, you remember before we moved, we talked about this job transfer, meaning longer hours for me, and you going back to work for a while? But we wanted better schools for Lee, a, a nicer home, a cleaner neighborhood. I knew there was something I wanted to show you. Look at this. When I got home, I took Lee's mail to his room, and I noticed this paper on his desk. It's a flyer from school. It's telling any who want to be on the team to show up for tryouts on Wednesday. That's today. Right. Do you suppose he has actually gone to the tryouts, and that's why he's later than usual getting home? I had no idea. I knew he liked to play ball. But on the school team? Well, I just don't know. What are you going to do, Bud? You know the Bible principles on that. Yes, I know. I'm surprised he did this without talking with us about it first. There's something else that bothers me. I think the coach at school exercises a lot of influence on Lee. Lately, all he talks about is Mr. Harvey. Hi, Mom, Dad. Hello, son. Hi. I'll eat your supper, and you can eat with your father. Oh, no thanks, Mom. I just ate. You just ate? Where? Coach took a few of us out for a burger after, uh, tryouts. Tryouts? Then you actually did try out for the team. Yes, I did. Oh, Lee, you didn't. You mean you went ahead without talking it over with us? Well, I... Lee, I'm disappointed in you. Didn't we have an agreement that you wouldn't go out for the team? Well, yeah, I guess so, but... I'm sorry, Dad. It was only tryouts. So, did you make the team? Well, I don't know yet. The coach and his assistants will meet tonight to decide. I'll probably find out tomorrow. We'll talk about it later. After the elders leave. The elders? You remember, I told you they were going to make a shepherding call on the family. And they especially wanted to talk with you. You forgot? Yeah, I guess I did. Who's coming, do you know? Brothers Fairfield and Hernandez. Why? Oh, nothing. I was just hoping Brother Edwards would come. He's so easy to talk to. Well, I'll go and clean up before they get here.
works out, I should be able to come off the overtime, say, in two or three months. And I'm hoping to work only part-time in a few months. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I can imagine that your recent move to this area must have really put you under pressure financially. And I'm glad you'll be getting this under control soon. You're both an asset to this congregation now, and will be even more so when you get your financial affairs under control. We enjoy the congregation. Glad to be a part of it. I'm very happy here, too. And I hope to start pioneering as soon as we get on our feet financially. Well, as you know, one reason for our visit tonight is to talk about Lee. Let me ask you this, bud. How's your family study going? Well, uh, to be honest, it's not too regular. So much keeps coming up. That's often the case, and it really takes effort to cope. Well, I'm not exactly indifferent to the spirituality of my household, Miguel. Well, I'm sure you're not, bud. But the enemy does use subtle means to lure young ones away from Jehovah. And that's when the grounding in the truth becomes so vital. I know that in Lee's case, he has a good knowledge of Bible principles. Is there something else that could be hindering him? If I could comment here... Please do, Ann. Lee seems to be getting very close to Mr. Harvey, his coach in school. Frankly, I think the coach has too much influence on him. I agree. But I'm so limited in the time I have with Lee. Seems Lee spends more time with Mr. Harvey than he does with us. It worries us. I see. Keeping the family ties strong is vital, isn't it? Spending time with our youngsters is emphasized in the Bible. Uh, for instance, at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, where it stresses keeping God's law before your children. Would you read that, bud? All right. You must also teach them to your sons, so as to speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. And you must write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I guess that I'll just have to make the time to be with Lee more, and without delay. We both will, bud, and really get down to studying together as a family. That's fine, Ann. In your prayers, ask Jehovah for help, and he'll give it. He never fails us. Hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Lee, we're glad you could join us. Miguel and I wanted to talk with you some this evening. Uh-oh, I must be in trouble. <laughs> no, not really. We're glad to have you with us. Your comments at the meetings are good. Your talks in the school are, too. But the one you gave two weeks ago was outstanding. But to be perfectly honest, we are concerned that your time in the field has slacked off. We're wondering why and whether we could help in any way. It seems unusual that your field service has dropped the way it has, and you don't comment in meetings as much as you used to. When you were in my book study group, your hand was up all the time, and your answers were always right on target. Well, there's nothing wrong. I've just been pretty busy the last couple of months. Brothers, if I may explain something here... Lee's interest in school has included more than just maintaining a high-grade average, which he does. He also likes to play ball after school. Anne and I have allowed that. It's a healthy release of energy. Since there are so many things kids in the truth can't do, this seemed to be something we could allow if it didn't interfere with his theocratic activities. And when kept in balance with theocratic activities, bud, some sports can provide just that, a healthy release. But in school sports, there is the element of possible bad association to be reckoned with. And if it begins to interfere with Jehovah's service, then it becomes life-threatening. It can lead you off the road to life. Lee. Is it school sports that's causing your field service to drop off? Lee, maybe you could tell the brothers why you were late getting home tonight. Well, I just stayed after school to play some ball with the boys. That's all. 
That's not quite all, Lee. He wasn't just playing ball. He was trying out for the school team. Oh, Mom, I probably won't even make the team. And if you do, will you accept? I don't know. I have to wait and see. You know the Bible principles that are involved in matters of this kind, don't you, Lee? Uh, what about you, bud? How do you feel about your son being on the school team? I'm not enthused about it. But Lee is 16 now, and he's beginning to make some of his own decisions. He's been raised in the truth, and I think he loves the truth. Anne and I have stressed that he should always put Jehovah and the meetings and service in first place. Playing ball is secondary. If he plays on the team, he has to attend all the meetings and keep up his hours in field service. Lee knows that, and he agrees with that. And besides that, Anne and I want Lee to serve Jehovah because he wants to, not because we tell him to. And if Lee begins to take some false steps that lead him away from Jehovah, what then, bud? Then it's time for some readjustments to be made, like Galatians 6 1 says. Bud, I'm happy to hear you say that, and to stress that Jehovah and the meetings and service come first. And not only should you want Lee to serve Jehovah because he wants to, but you should help him to cultivate the right motive for doing so. But let me ask you, no, let me ask you, Lee, for what other reason are we encouraged not to get involved in extracurricular activities in school? I suppose 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Which says? Bad associations spoil useful habits. So let me ask you, Lee, do you consider the other bowl players bad associations? Frankly, Brother Fairfield, no, I don't. They're not witnesses. They don't go to the kingdom hall. But they don't take drugs, as far as I know. They know I'm a witness. Seem to respect me for that. I'm not involved in their social affairs and don't intend to be. That's right, Arthur. This neighborhood is so much better than the one where we used to live. We've had a few of the young people drop by here at the house. They appear to be from good families. One girl, Robin Hart, lives down the street and seems very nice. That's why Bud and I haven't objected to Lee's having limited association with them. There's so much emphasis put on associations in sports, but bad associations are everywhere. Why, I was even propositioned once out in field service. Like Jesus said, we're in the world, but no part of it. I don't want to be a part of the world. I just want to play ball, have a friendly game now and then. You make all of that sound very reasonable, Lee. And I'm sure there are others who think that way. But there's a risk factor here that we can't forget. Satan the devil. He made wrongdoing in Eden sound so reasonable to Eve. But how terrible the consequences. Ephesians 6.11, according to the footnote, warns us to stand firm against the crafty acts of the devil. Anne, do you have your copies of the reasoning book handy? I'll get them. The devil is so cunning, he can make bad associations seem good. Now, what about our looking at page 189? Under the subheading, Bad Associations right after the scripture citation of Proverbs 1, 10 through 19. Lee, would you begin reading there, please? Okay. It says, If a person is not a worshiper of Jehovah, but he does seem to be really nice, would you view him as a suitable friend? Shechem was the son of a Canaanite chieftain, and the Bible says he was the most honorable of the whole house of his father. But he took Dinah and lay down with her and violated her. I remember the account. Now, Anne, how would you describe Dinah's associates? Well, being the daughters of a chieftain, they no doubt were what we might consider high society. 
probably dressed well, very refined. What happened to Dinah Lee? She got raped. By whom? Sheikham. And how was he regarded, Anne? He was the most honorable man in his father's house. In other words, a nice guy for a worldly man, right? Yeah, I guess so. So from Jehovah's standpoint, Lee, would she can be considered a good associate? Of course not. Lee, do you see how the devil craftily used the situation to seduce Dinah into thinking these highly respected Canaanites would be good association? In this case, yes. But my friends aren't like that. They're not rapists. No, nor was Shechem regarded as such. But what was there to restrain Shechem from doing what he did? He was no worshiper of Jehovah. He had no fear of God. So when he saw this beautiful visitor, what was there to stop him? Nothing. So Jehovah's name was reproached. Jacob's family was shamed. And many lives were lost. The tragic results show the devil was behind it all. And today, Lee, the devil with his crafty devices is more active than ever before. He's out to deceive us. And one way he does this is to make people think that what Jehovah has called bad is really good and to be enjoyed. I'm sure what your brothers are saying is true, but it's hard to imagine someone like like Robin Hart, being immoral or taking drugs. She seems so innocent. But maybe I need to readjust my thinking. How do you feel about all this, Lee? Uh, I have to think about it. Please do, Lee. And pray about it, too, won't you? Lee, I'm going out in field service this Saturday, and if you'd like to come along, we can talk about it then. I don't know. I'll let you know. Well, we'd better go. It's getting late. We appreciate the three of you spending the time with us. You brothers can't go now. I've baked some cookies for you. And I'll make some coffee. I'll get them. It'll only take a minute. Well, you know how I like your cookies, Anne. Count me in, too. You should look at the other side of the coin. You're good. 
you could end up with an athletic scholarship that would pay for your college education. There, you'd make contacts valuable later on in whatever career you followed. Being in athletics teaches you how to get along with people, develop qualities of leadership, lots of other advantages. What if I come to your house and talk with your parents? Would that help some? Uh, it's good of you to offer to do this, Coach, but I don't think that's necessary. If we meet my parents' conditions, it'll be all right with them. Thanks, Coach. I'll see you at practice. After Lee's first game on the team, there's a party to celebrate the victory. A victory largely because of Lee's outstanding play. He's very popular as a result, especially with the girls. He's pressured by both his teammates and several girls to attend the party. Lee's flattered, but he says no to the party, aware of his promise to his parents. Now it is Monday after that first game on Friday. It is after practice on Monday, after a shower, and he is in the school corridor at his locker, getting some of his books for his homework that evening. Robin Hart comes by, carrying her books. Hi, Lee. How are you? Oh, hi, Robin. I'm fine. And you? I'm great, especially after that game Friday. You were super. Oh, the team did great, didn't they? Well, the team was okay, but you were great. You scored the winning point. I was out watching the practice today with a lot of others. Everybody's excited. Yeah, I noticed quite a crowd in the stands. The student bodies all steamed up. Looks like we might go all the way this year. Lee? What, Robin? I'm stuck for a ride home. Could you give me a lift? Okay, let's go.
pressure from my teammates to go to a victory celebration after the game and a couple other invitations. But I turned them all down. It's a good thing I did. I learned later that alcohol was used. Marijuana, too. So it was good you weren't there, wasn't it? Yes. It did turn out to be bad association. But my not going to any of the parties made me look stuck up or something. But that's not why I asked to see you, Brother Edwards. I'm listening. I know you are. That's why I asked to talk to you. You listen. Well, Monday night after practice, a girl at school, Robin Hart, asked for a ride home. She was very friendly, raved about how I was the star of the game last Friday. I felt flattered. When I got her home, she insisted I come in for some pizza. So I did. Her parents weren't home. Did you know that before you went in? No, and I'm not sure that would have stopped me. She is a very friendly girl and very attractive. My parents had seen her around the neighborhood. She lives near us, and they have a good impression of her. So did I. So I went in. Well, we ate the pizza and were sitting on the sofa talking generally. Then she started in again on how great a player I was and how she liked me. Well, well, I'm not going to spell it all out. We started kissing, and we both got pretty excited. I finally realized she was ready to go much further, and that scared me. I mean, coming that close, I was really scared. I thought of being disfellowshipped. The pain it would cause my parents, my not being able to talk to or be with any of my friends. And finally, I thought of being unfaithful to Jehovah, which should have been my first thought, but it wasn't. My first thoughts were selfish about the consequences to me. Anyway, I got out of there. I realized that Robin was the female counterpart of Shechem. A nice enough girl, but without Jehovah's standards to guide her. Brother Edwards, I learned a powerful lesson in there. Worldly girls that seem nice can have worldly standards that are not so nice. That was a close call, Lee. I'm glad you came to your senses in time and avoided falling into one of Satan's deadliest traps. You've learned a valuable lesson. But have you discussed this with your parents? No, not yet. But I guess I should. I just wanted to talk to you first. I know this. I'm going to the coach tomorrow and telling him I'm quitting the team. You think you can go to practice and play in the games and that's the end of it. But it isn't. The language is not good. The association is not good. The pressures to socialize are heavy. It's all just too much to get involved with and at the same time maintain your joy in the congregation. So you can see, Lee, how Satan can be very crafty in setting snares for us. In your case, the counsel of Arthur and Miguel was right on target. Being based on God's word, it was like reminders from Jehovah. Lee, read the last part of Psalm 19, verse 7. The reminder of Jehovah is trustworthy, making the inexperienced one wise. Do you see now that if you had heeded it, you would not have had to learn this lesson the hard way? Yes, I see that now. Next time, I'll be more receptive to counsel. I'll talk to Mom and Dad now, and then talk to the coach tomorrow morning. Brother Edwards, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Have a good evening. Same to you, Lee.
easy way to say this, so I'll come right to the point. I have to leave the team. What? Why, Lee? It's not working out. Pressure to go to parties, to socialize, and sometimes being exposed to alcohol, drugs, sex. It's just the very things my parents warned me about. There's too much pressure to go against Bible principles. I told you, you don't have to get involved socially, Lee. It's tough not to. If you always refuse, you begin to come across as stuck up. I don't want that. Makes me uncomfortable. It gives the impression I'm some kind of an oddball. Anyway, I never have fit into the party scene. It bothers my conscience. It goes against all the principles I've grown up with. You know you saved the game for us last Friday, don't you? The team needs you. The students are all excited about the team. We could go all the way this year. You're letting the team down. You're letting the school down. You're letting me down. I'm sorry, but if I keep on, I'll be letting Jehovah down. I give up. You're too good for this world. If I'm going to make the new world, I have to be too good for this old world. is good. Why, you have a new pioneer and two new publishers. And you brothers are doing well, taking the lead in field service and shepherding the flock. Now, the last item on our agenda is coping with the devil's crafty acts. Since you brought this up, Brother Edwards, maybe you'd like to speak first. Well, We've had a couple of instances where we had to meet with some of the publishers to give them counsel. One case shows how Satan can sneak in with his crafty axe. It concerns the Harper family. Yes, I worked with Sister Harper and Lee, and they seem to be doing fine now. She's working part-time and pioneering, and Lee's planning on pioneering this summer with his friend Jerry Carter. Bud Harper, too, seems to be cutting back on some of his overtime work, and he's studying regularly with his family. Yes, they are doing well, but as we all know, it could have been tragic. We can thank Jehovah that the good counsel we heard from Arthur and Miguel about bad associations did sink in. He thought about it, and he heeded it. A little late, it's true, but in time. He recalled Miguel's use of the reasoning book and the case of Shechem, an honorable man in the world, but even so, not good association for Jehovah's people. Lee thought of Shechem in connection with a friendly neighborhood girl. Perhaps a nice worldly girl, but not a good associate for him. So he learned a lesson the hard way, but he learned it. It sounds like a story with a happy ending. The Harper family is back on track and going full steam ahead. However, this case does illustrate the need for constant vigilance in order to carry on our spiritual warfare. Many families today come under various pressures, and we need to help them to always keep on the complete suit of spiritual armor. What you say, Brother Taylor, is so true. It is evident that the devil is stepping up his attacks, and he uses subtle means to turn some away from Jehovah. So everyone needs to be fortified. What 
happened in the Harper family simply illustrates why every family in the organization should be prepared to cope with the adversary's crafty acts. Do you have any suggestions that would help our brothers? The youths among us especially need help to cope with the modern-day tricks of the devil. Their lives are at stake. I don't have anything miraculous, brothers. But there is cause for genuine concern. At 2 Peter 1, 12 and 13, the apostles stressed the value of reminders to rouse us to action. Any organization provides reminders to help us keep our senses and be watchful in view of the wily tactics of our adversary. What are some things you recall? Brother Fearfield. Jehovah and his organization have told us for years just what to do to ward off the devil's attack. As for the children, the parents have to take seriously the need to get close to their children, hold a regular family Bible study with them, and watch their associations in school, in their own neighborhood. Some parents don't realize what a threat worldly children are. Many worldly children today are involved in spiritism, sexual perversions, alcohol, and drugs. And these children come from so-called good homes. Brother Edwards? Some parents are naive about peer pressure. They say, my children's friends are decent. Famous last words. Brother Hernandez? There's no question about the need to put up a hard fight. Most are doing so. It seems to be a minority of our young people who are having serious problems. Most are doing quite well. They're regular publishers. Many are involved in building kingdom halls or are auxiliary pioneers. They're fine examples. But it hurts to lose even one, doesn't it? Brother, your comment? I believe some parents are unable to detect when their son or daughter begins to drift out of the truth. Something really serious has to come up before they realize there is a problem. And then, when their children have left the truth, parents are haunted with the question, where did we fail? Or they pass it off with the thought that perhaps the child's heart was bad and there was nothing they could do anyway. We need to help parents recognize the role they play in training their children and to recognize the danger signals. Those are good points. Let me ask you, brothers, what things should you look for in someone, primarily a youngster, that would indicate a spiritual problem? Well, participants at meetings certainly are in need of attention. The Bible says that out of the heart's abundance his mouth speaks. If no expressions of love for Jehovah and the truth come out of their children's mouth, the parents should wake up and find out if the truth is in their children's heart. And it's not just what the youth say or don't say at the meetings. Parents should also concern themselves with the casual conversation around the home. Good points, brothers. Brother Hernandez. It goes without saying... Low hours in fuel service month after month are a danger signal. Then, too, is your child prepared? Is he afraid of what his classmates think? Do you work along with him in service, or do you send him out with someone else? Do you help him to be effective at the doors? Does he believe the truth in his heart? You must find these things out. Where is the best place for parents to find the answers to these questions? Brother Fairfield? In the family Bible study. There's no substitute for it. No other meeting takes its place. In the family study, you can take the time you need to get close to your children and hug them. Tell them how you feel about Jehovah and why you love him. Ask if he is real to them. Find out if they pray to him and how often. Then you know what to work on and what to study with them. I think you've captured the true purpose of the family study, Brother Fairfield. 
We cannot deceive ourselves into thinking that our children are developing spiritually just because they are attending meetings and going out in field service. What Brother Fairfield mentioned about the family Bible study is worthy of note. Such a study should not just be a book review or to count an hour's service. Jehovah tells us to inculcate the truth into our children so that they may keep living. Without this effort, our children are easy prey for the devil. Is there any other danger that you brothers have noticed? Yes, Brother Hernandez. Worldly associations in school and in the neighborhood are dangerous. There is danger. True. And especially is that so in these difficult times. Jehovah is aware of the strong demon influence aimed at subverting our young people's faith. It's therefore not coincidental that we now have more information to study with our children than we ever had before. Jehovah knows what we need, and he supplies us with the proper food at the right time. But he has entrusted into the hands of the parents the education of children to instill in them godly principles. Such was the case in ancient Israel, and so it is today. Brother Fearfield, and if this is done, then we will know what our children are thinking, what their convictions are. And when the demons attack with peer pressure at school or in the neighborhood, our children will have the faith, strength, and integrity that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. That's exactly right. If we are to train our children so that they can make such a stand and maintain their integrity, then we have to make good use of what the society has provided, such as the youth book and our latest book, Young people ask, while the pressures are greater today, we're better equipped to cope if we take advantage of what Jehovah has given us. Brother Fairfield, this meeting has given us some very timely points to consider. It might be a good idea if we could include these points in our discussions with the brothers when we make shepherding calls. That's an excellent idea. And you may want to work up a service talk on this subject for your next local needs part on the service meeting program. George, I believe you have that part in a few weeks. Could you work something up based on our discussion here? Certainly. I'm sure the brothers would appreciate the information. The devil's crafty acts are aimed at more areas than just school sports. He shows great versatility and attacks as a roaring lion or slithers in like a snake in the grass. The main thing is to oppose the devil. So all of us should heed Paul's counsel at Ephesians 6, 11 through 13 by putting on the complete suit of armor from God and standing firm against the crafty acts of the devil. The drama you have just seen highlighted the dangers of young brothers getting deeply involved in school sports and bad associations. But the devil's crafty acts are aimed in many other directions, and not only at youthful witnesses, but at all of those who are dedicated servants of Jehovah. So all of us, young and old, must put on the complete suit of our from God. And having done so, we must allow no kinks in the form of poor study habits, missed meetings, or irregular field service to develop in our armor. Such weak spots would surely be targets for the wicked one's burning missiles. Nothing short of the complete suit of armor from God will suffice to enable us to stand firm against the crafty acts of the devil.